recording in progress. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, first of all, for being flexible with me last week. Um, the scheduling made my life a lot easier to know that. Uh, you know, we have no problem showing up for uh, Carl and getting through some lecture material, so we don't fall too far behind. Um, and I really, I feel like so this this material, if we take our time with the quantum stuff and and understanding conversions, laying some groundwork, this stuff is really not that tricky, right? Some stuff like atomic radius, like electron configuration, what is an orbital? That stuff can get kind of tricky. But when you understand that, atomic radius and some of these other things we're going to talk about, sort of everything sort of falls into place a little bit more. This stuff should feel fairly simple compared to learning electron configurations for the first time. So hopefully everybody else agrees with me on that one, um, or at least is getting there. A um, couple, couple of uh, random quiz questions. I get, it's not this question exactly every year, but I get a question about some random health, wellness, dietary trends every year. Um, and the first one that I saw this year was uh, about water quality and salt lamps producing negative ions and that being good for you or alleviating anxiety and things like that. Um, so first off, there's, not a whole lot, and by that I mean there's none, uh, no evidence, none evidence to suggest that that's really true. Um, yes, being by a waterfall is inherently relaxing, but that doesn't mean that it's got like clinical properties in that placebo test or anything like that. Um, but the reason that I always want to answer these questions is because there's a lot of um, bad science or stuff that should be it's not really bad science it's what's called pseudoscience out there and pseudoscience is basically um when you dress up something in scientific sounding words to sell a product usually um it might not be obvious what the product is um so and sometimes the people selling it actually believe it but a lot of um like quantum new age sort of um I guess belief systems like crystal healing or um you know that the universe has a has a what's the way they phrase it in the secret like quantum determinancy or something like that they use like quantum terminology because people don't understand what quantum means to try and turn around and sell books or sell their ability to speak at self-help seminars and things like that or sell salt lamps for way more than they're actually worth. Um, so it's it's really important to sort of be able to pay attention and sort of ask, approach any of these sort of claims with a crit with critical thought. Um, so and it's, it's similar to the, to astrology for that matter. It's sort of like when there's a claim, look at it. Is there has there actual research been done on it, or are they just hypothesizing this and then never following it up by doing any research. Maybe crystals have healing properties, but if nobody's actually studied it, then it's wrong to say that crystals have healing properties. Um, and there is a lot of element of placebo effect as well. Um, and I don't usually try to disabuse people of placebo effect, especially up here, I spend my time doing nothing but telling people about why crystal healing isn't true. Um, if people think that having that, that particular piece of amethyst on their mantle is going to um, create relaxing vibes in the space, then them thinking that means it is. That's fine. Just don't try to treat clinical depression with crystal healing um, when you should be seeing a therapist or taking your medication, that kind of thing. Um, Chris. So uh, with the ions thing, the science you teach on paracetamol actually did a video on. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there is like some evidence that like negative ions can be good for you, but the salt lamps emit nowhere near enough to make any kind of impact at all. Well, and you get negative ions just by virtue of eating and drinking. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing that 
So again, so it's not to say that you absolutely need negative ions in your diet and around you, but they're already part of nature and already present. There's nothing that you need to buy in order to increase the amount of negative ions around you. So it's like alkaline water. It's a product that's being sold rather than anything that's actually helpful. Alkaline water is the same thing. does absolutely nothing. Um, doesn't change your body pH or anything like that. Just this a health trend that is something that can be trendy for a little bit and then it'll fall out of favor and there'll be a new one, right? Um, it's, you know, it was the out, it was the Atkins diet before it was before it was a caveman diet before it was called keto. Um, you know, stuff like that is always going to be there. It's always marketed in some new way. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's anything to it scientifically. Um, and any but anytime you see a claim like that. You can go and look at, see if they source their claim, if they provide a source, and then look at their source. Just because they provide a source doesn't mean it's a good source, because half the time, probably more than half the time, their source is actually a quote-unquote study that they conducted themselves on their own product, or they paid somebody else to do a study on this product. So there's, a, there's an inherent conflict of interest a lot of times when you see these. You should be looking for studies that are done by disinterested parties, parties that don't have a uh, force in the race, so to speak. Um, they're not trying to sell a competing product. They're also not trying to sell this product. You should look at your studies that are done by people that are, you know, have no interest involved. Um, it's just like trying to find a good source for any sort of um, economic or political claim. You should be looking for something that's, you don't want to look at the two extremes and assume the truth is somewhere in the middle. You want to look at somebody who's disinterested considering these claims from both sides and see what conclusion is reached, what the evidence supports. Um, and one of your, I guess I don't know this for sure, but um, one of the assignments that I usually do in Chem 102 has, is basically like, has you read a couple of chapters on what is pseudoscience and here's a list of topics on Wikipedia that are considered pseudoscience, pick a few of them, research it yourself, and what claim do you come to? Or what conclusion do you reach when you do your own research? Um, and that, that list on Wikipedia is one of those, one of those Wikipedia lists of lists. Um, there's almost always going to be something on here that you thought was scientifically based, um, grew up with potentially um, that, that maybe you didn't even know was controversial. The one that got, that got me was um, chiropractic. I grew up going to chiropractors because my parents always took me to chiropractors when I was little, and they always went to chiropractors. And it turns out there's absolutely no scientific evidence that anything about chiropractic care has any sort of health benefits. Um, that was a surprise to me the first time I found that out. Um, so it's not always stuff that's, that's, you know, obvious to the outsider. It's kind of like, you know, what they call woo-woo. Um, meaning people get excited about it for, for, for no scientific reason. I like just think that's interesting because, like, I go to one and like, I can see results. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so that you can get positive results anecdotally, but there's nothing that, that chiropractors do that a physical therapist doesn't. The, the good chiropractors will have you doing PT exercises effectively um, for any sort of long-term in injury, and they will eventually make it so you don't need to keep coming back. Um, but if you look at the, the roots of chiropractic, it started with, it was basically like a westernized version of chakras and aligning things within the body and making these adjustments to get out the bad humors effectively in the late 1800s. Um, and and there's that's the part where if you get a, a unscrupulous, unscrupulous chiropractor, they could just continue to milk you week after week for years and years, like my parents have been doing for my entire life. Um, instead of going to see a physical therapist that will address the root change and get you to the point where you don't need to come back in there. Um, and it can make you feel better, but the, where it doesn't produce any in a double line test, there have been no cases where a chiropractor produced results that um, that could not, they're not explained by the placebo effect, basically. Um, so, which is what I found really interesting. But 
People still go to the chiropractor. They don't fight with my parents every time I see them about it. So if you're going to a chiropractor that works for you, anecdotally, maybe the placebo effect won't be as effective now that we've had this conversation for you personally. But um, if it works for you, keep going. Jack? Aren't most chiropractors just like a higher level of physical therapy? It depends on what you mean by higher level. Like they're practicing PTs and then they decide to go on to be more chiropractic. Yeah. Yeah. That's there, so you do see that sometimes. I, you know, that's that's on a case by case basis. The chiropractors that I know personally were, you know, graduated from from high school or from college and immediately went to chiropractic school. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, they, I don't mean to say that they don't do any good, but there's the, the root of chiropractic and where it came from doesn't have a basis in science, so it's considered a pseudoscience. Um, because it's not been demonstrated to have any effects beyond just regular PT. But any, like I said, um, you will almost everybody will find something on this list of things characterized as pseudoscience that is um, either something you haven't considered or something that you feel is offensive to you because it shouldn't be on this list. Um, and I encourage you to embrace that and read through it and see. See what you make up your own decision. Um, talk to me about it. Ask more questions about it. I'll try to be non non judgmental or condescending as possible when I'm answering questions, and uh, I won't always bring it up in front of the class if it seems like it's something that's really you know matters a lot to you personally. It seems maybe right, and I will you know I will leave that and just have a conversation with you privately. Um, if that's something that a conversation you're interested in having. Anyway, going on to why are there different colors of rust for different elements, like copper turns green and iron turns red. Um, turns out that every metal has will oxidize under the right conditions. And oxidizing just means that it can give away an electron to form an ion. We're going to talk a lot about what that means and how that works as we get going here. Um, but the reason that it's relevant now is because it's the same logic for why different elements glow different colors when you pass current through them. Different metals have different energy levels. And when they oxidize, you put electrons into different energy levels and they start forming bonds of oxygen that form oxides, which is what the, the actual substance we think of as rust or um, silver being tarnished is silver oxide, um, things like that. The patina, as they call it in, in decorating or in uh, metallurgy on copper or bronze or brass is all oxidation that's happening. And all those different colors are just the result of different energy levels getting exposed as a result of moving electrons around. Um, so it's, it is all still tied tied together and things that we will, feel, we will talk about. Um, and then this one, are there other unique colors of rust? So we would call it oxide generally. We usually use the term rust specifically for iron oxide. Um, and we'd call um, for bronze or copper, they call that greenish blue rust or oxidation. They usually call that uh, verdigris um, is, the, is the technical name for it, or we just call it oxide. Um, but one of the, the coolest elements on the um, oxidation. When it comes to these, so we get here. Um, chromium actually has several, and you can look at here's an example of several different um, uh, oxidation states for chromium that all have different colors that tied to their various electron configurations in the different states. Um, that's actually where chromium gets its name, chroma in Greek literally means color. Um, so chromium is named chromium because when it's oxidized, you get all these different fun colors. Um, but yeah, pretty much, oh, there's a lot of them that will, where the oxide is either transparent in the UV, so it'll actually either show up as just being totally transparent or show up as being white, colorless. Um, and then there's a lot that are wind up just being black that absorb everything in the visible region. 
Um, so silver oxide in particular, that tarnish that you see on the outside of silver um, is, is the silver oxide. And then some of them you get really fun colors like that. Yeah. So uh, with the rust and iron oxide, you can get tetanus. Can you get that also from other oxides or is it just? That's a good question. So tetanus is an infection. So it's a result of, of a of something that kind of lives on the surface of the metal. Um, and so I don't know, different metals do um, behave differently because sometimes the surface of the metal can actually be antiseptic. Um, like platinum catalyzes certain reactions and naturally tends to, to cause bacteria to not be able to live on the surface of platinum, for instance, um, and silver the same way, that's, that's actually how Another pseudoscience, um, colloidal silver, um, got its start with the idea that silver naturally as a surface was antiseptic. So why wouldn't we make nanoparticles out of it and drink it? Um, just, as a, just as a side note, when you look at these different colors, almost always um, in, this is what's called inorganic chemistry, because it's not carbon-based. The more vivid the colors you get, the more poisonous it is. So don't go drinking any brightly colored solutions because those are the ones that are most likely to kill you and give you heavy metal poisoning. Um, just, just as a disclaimer, um, you're not going to get superpowers. You're just going to get dead. What's the chemistry behind nuclear bombs? I've hinted at this a few times. I've talked about weak, weak force and strong force, and there's a whole chapter on nuclear chemistry. Um, but just as a way of... of um, Describing this, and I, just because I got this question actually several times. Um, no, go. Where's my? So, and I'm going to mix up which one it is. I always do this. Uranium two thirty eight, probably. Um, is a pretty unstable nucleus, but it's got a very long half-life in general. It doesn't spontaneously degrade that quickly. Um, but when you expose it to a neutron, you can wind up making uranium-239 that immediately splits up into several pieces. Um, and one of those pieces is usually lead, um, is an isotope of lead, and one of those pieces is an isotope of tin, maybe. Um, but you also get three more neutrons as a side product. Basically, what happens is you make that uranium nucleus so unstable by firing a, a neutron at it that it splits into pieces, and some of those pieces are more neutrons. Well, if some of those pieces are more neutrons that got fired off, they could wind up getting embedded into the nucleus of other uranium-238 nuclei, right? Each of these neutrons we just made can start this whole process over again, right? And so you wind up with exponential growth. If you have a large enough chunk of uranium-238 that, um, that it's capturing more of these neutrons than are being emitted to the surroundings, then you wind up with a chain reaction happening and that exponential growth means that very, very quickly this reaction winds up getting out of control. Um, and the, if you add up all the pieces, we'd need to know the exact isotopes of these and then sum up the, the weights of the individual isotopes. But we can actually look at the energy for this reaction. The change in energy for this reaction is equal to the change in the mass times the speed of light squared. What you wind up seeing when you put this in kilojoules per mole terms is, is um, basically that it's roughly a million times more energetic of a reaction than TNT exploding per mole. Um, and with uranium being so dense, you can actually put more of it in the same, in the same volume. And so that's how even the, the smallest nuclear bombs um, the ones that were detonated in New Mexico and then over Hiroshima and Nagasaki are, they're rated in terms of kilotons of TNT. So the first bomb that was dropped, um, was it Little Man, I think, on Hiroshima 
was, you know, maybe this tall, the size from here to the wall, about this tall. Um, and it only had, it had two chunks of two slugs of uranium that basically just got slammed together to get above that threshold where you get that chain reaction happening, which they call critical mass. So basically all it was, was slug of uranium 238 and another slug of uranium 238 inside a tube with dynamite on each end, regular TNT explosives. So all this really did is you made two bullets effectively fired at each other. And each of these was, uh, was about 75% of the critical mass needed. So when you slam them together, you get one big hunk of uranium in the middle that's above that threshold that caused that chain reaction. So the engineering to do this is actually really simple. It's getting pure enough sample of uranium-238 um, without causing a meltdown in the process, um, which that actually slowed the process down and made it take a whole year once they got all of American scientists working on the same project, more or less. It still took them about a year because they had to get this, ura this much uranium-238. Are they getting it from like the dirty water? Not even so heavy water, which is what you're thinking of, and that's deuterium. So that would that's useful for um, for making fusion bombs, which we hadn't even gotten to at this point yet. Um, but so the all they were really doing is uranium is actually pretty pervasive. It's present in really small amounts, pretty much globally. All you have to do is be looking and at the right ores that occur pretty much worldwide and then you have to refine it and then you have to enrich it um, to get it to be pure enough to do this um, and when that's the part that actually took a really long time um, they did most of that in berkeley and in uh, oak ridge tennessee and then they shipped the uranium from those two places to los alamos in new mexico where they actually assembled the devices and did the tests because they actually had to figure out what critical mass was um, and actually there were there were two fatalities in the manhattan project on american soil because while they were doing these tests they did something like they're testing how radioactive this uranium was um, when you got it at various sizes and and um they used like basically radiation suits and then they would go in by hand they didn't have robotics at this time either and put a big lead bell over the chunk of uranium and they would lift it off measure how radioactive it was and put it back down um and they one of these tests they had um somebody i don't remember exactly what, what happened but the the uranium they were testing got knocked to the ground and so the guy who was in there doing the test literally had to pick it up, put it back on the table so he could seal it. Um, so that you know the rest of the, the facility didn't get irradiated. And he wound up dying of radiation poisoning a couple of days later. Um, so it was definitely that was producing the uranium that was really the, the tricky part there. Richard Feynman tells an interesting joke about the fact that they were storing their uranium separately at Oak Ridge um, in two different rooms, except that the rooms were just separated by drywall and they were right next to each other. So the doors were on, in two different hallways, but the rooms were back to back and uranium was, was being put, you know, at the, yeah, a big pile of uranium here and a big pile of uranium there separated only by drywall. They got really, really close to causing a nuclear meltdown in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, because um, they hadn't developed safety protocols for dealing with this stuff. And, and you know, if, if Richard Feynman hadn't noticed that, then that would have been a huge setback and caused a big loss of life on, on US soil as a result of that. Um, so uh, nuclear chemistry is, is its own beast and its own chapter in here. And it's very, very fascinating in the history of it. We know a lot about because it was kind of an important time in history worldwide um and we have good documentation for it too so if you're interested in that kind of stuff that uh history of science stuff um I, there's some books i can recommend um so just come ask me 
And then we'll talk about the Fermi paradox another time because that's also related to the Manhattan Project, but that's its whole, a whole different conversation. So we'll move on for now. Um, reminder, we've got a quiz on Thursday in class when you first get here. And again, it's just, if I say, if I say AR, you have to write argon. If I say TI, you have to write titanium. If I say gold, you have to write AU. It'll be 20 where I give you the name and you write the symbol, so the short way, less writing way, and 10 where I give you the symbol, you write the name. So the table fair game. It'll be focused mostly on the top ends, but there'll be a couple from down on the row six and seven. It's all verbal. No, it'll be all out of print out. Oh, okay. Sorry, when I say if I say I mean if it's written. Got it. I was like, yeah, I'm down for that. Let's do it. Um, and it's really just Yes, it's just plain memorizing, but it's it's so that there's no confusion when we start getting into naming compounds. You're not mixing up chlorine and chlorobium um, because they're very different, and I you know, we don't want to have to specify. You know, wait, which one is that? We just want to get it all down, so we don't need to waste time thinking about it anymore, right? That's, you know, and then it'll come back on the final. Be helpful um, if you have all that down. You want to think about it as much. Um, Using noble gas, not Nobel gas, noble gas abbreviations. I mentioned this to today's lab, but for yesterday's lab, when we're doing electron configurations, you're allowed to use, um, it's not incorrect to just say that the electron configuration of something is the same as a noble gas. But for this class, I want you to show me what that is until you get above 18 electrons. When there are more than 18 electrons, you're allowed to use the, those abbreviations. Um, so if, we, if I wanted to say what's the um, the noble gas config or the electron configuration for calcium, calcium's got 20 electrons. So we could say it's argon and then 4s2. That system in the brackets means everything's the same up to argon, and then we have 4s2. But I only want you to use this system when you get above 18 electrons. And I don't want you to ever say, like, if it was, um, if we're talking about, say, what was the next one? Strontium 2 plus. If we said strontium 2 plus, we could just say it wouldn't be wrong to say that the electron configuration of strontium 2 plus is the same as krypton. That's correct. But for this class, I'm interested in you showing me that you know how the orbital, the, the order of those orbitals were. So I would want you to, instead of writing it like that, um, go down one level on the periodic table and write it as. Oh, it's argon, and then 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. These are really saying the same thing. But again, for this class, I'm testing on do you know how to do this part? So I don't want to see, I don't want to see just the noble gas configuration for anything. Does that make sense? Does that seem reasonable? Once we get past this quarter, I have then, well, one, I won't be teaching it. So you can talk to who, um, the uh, instructor for the for winter, but probably doing it this way would be fine once you've shown that you can do it this way, right? Walk before you can run. Um, let's do, before we get into talking about electron configuration rules in the transition metals, uh, let's walk through the practice or the quiz problem so that anybody who struggled with it can see where they may have gotten hung up. All right, so 
if we have a violet light producing photons with a wavelength of 415 nanometers and this many joules are produced in one second, how many moles of photons are produced per second? So there's a couple things to think about here. The most obvious is that we have two different types of units involved here, right? We've got a wavelength in nanometers and then we have energy here. So since we're gonna, we need to be as consistent as possible with our units. The first thing we should think about is, well, I can turn that wavelength into energy per photon, right? Because we've practiced that a few times at this point. So remember that there's a couple different versions of this equation. There's this version coupled with uh, C equals lambda nu. There's energy equals Planck's constant times the frequency. There's also speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. Or you can do the substitution and combine them, get the simple simplified version or the one-step version um, where energy is equal to H times C over lambda. Since H and C are constants, and if we know the wavelength, we can get the energy per photon by doing this. Right. so when we plug that in, we get the energy of a single photon is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus, I always miss this, 34, right? Joules times seconds and 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second, both of which you would find by looking up if you don't have them memorized. It's fine, you don't need to memorize them. They're on your conversion sheet. Divided by the wavelength, but we need our wavelength to be in meters because our speed of light is in meters. So put that in meters, we get 4.15 times 10 to the minus seven meters. And that just comes from that conversion that 10 to the nine nanometers is equal to one meter. All right, so that gives us an energy per photon. And I'm gonna erase all this after, unless there's questions so far, you good so far? What do we get as our answer for energy per photon? Does anybody have their notes? 4.79 And if you track your units, that's in joules, because joules times seconds times meters per second, seconds cancel out, and then we had meters on top and bottom, which canceled out. So we're in joules. If we want to know, if this is joules per photon, First off, knowing what this equation solves for is half the battle here. Knowing that this energy, this really, really small number is joules per photon is what's gonna allow us to go to do the next step. Um, because if we know that we make 2.15 times 10 to the four joules are produced in one second, we wanna know how many moles of photons that is. We're going to use this as a conversion. We're going to cancel out joules and be left in photons. So we have this many joules and every 4.79 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is one photon. This will tell us how many photons we have. Since the question then says how many moles of photons, we would want to take that one step further and say, okay, well, then for every 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, photons is one mole. All right, and so if you go through this whole process, I'm not sure where people were dropping Dropping decimals, I had a lot of answers that were the right answer, but off by a couple factors of 10. Um, the right answer 
0 0.0745, I think, or something. Um, not times 10 to anything. Moles of photons. I got a lot of 7.45 moles of photons, and I got 7.45 times 10 to the minus 4 photons. I got 7.45 times 10 to the 7 photons. So a lot of people did the right steps, but missed some conversion someplace. Um, probably converting nanometers. The fact that it's the same coefficient, but off by factors of 10, means it's usually one of, um, one of those metric conversions that you messed up. Um, that would be the, the first place I would look because if you're off by something, if it's not a clean factor of 10, then or if it's a clean factor of 10 to drop, it's probably one a uh, prefix conversion. I saw some hands. Yeah, so when you change that to a 15 nanometers to meters, you say 10 to the 90 meters and not the meters. So, yes. So 415 nanometers, the conversion is 10 to the 9, or the, on our conversion sheet, 10 to the minus 9, but we know that nano means small, right? So there's a lot of nanometers. So 10 to the 9 nanometers is 1 meter. So nanometers cancels nanometers. So it's 415 divided by 10 to the 9. So if we write that out, the long way, it's going to be 415 times 10 to the minus 9, but then move that over two more spots. You get 4.15 10 to the minus 7. All right, anybody else? Any other spots where people got hung up? Again, you didn't need to necessarily write these out as conversions, but since we've been practicing conversions so much, and my mind naturally thinks in conversions, this is the way that, that makes the most sense to me to, to show my work. If you were able to make the units cancel out properly and get, you'll probably get the right answer, even if you showed your work another way. The key is to keep track of those units and to not, not wind up multiplying by this number when you were supposed to divide for instance, so that'd be a really easy thing to do, right? Um, and you'll notice one more point about this. I, I said in one second and per second, but since everything is per second, we can just say, let's just assume that we're looking at one second. We don't need to put per second in here. We, although we can't, we can. And that just means at the end, we get an answer in moles, photons over seconds. But since everything is in one second, if I said something like, um, how many moles of photons are produced in 15 seconds? Then we would need to take this into consideration, this rule per second. But since everything is already in per second, we didn't need to worry about it too much. It was a little bit of a red herring. David? Um, for the unit Planck constant, big in what is that, joule seconds? Yes. That confused me for the units. So it's the units on Planck's constant don't make a whole lot of sense on their own. Joules times seconds. It's not like the speed of light where we know what speed is. The units on Planck's constant. They're not entropy units. I said that last time. Entropy units are joules per mole per Kelvin. Um, joules times seconds are just, it's just sort of a weird combined unit that no matter where we find Planck's constant, it always has those same units attached to it as a result of the other calculations going on. Um, so it doesn't, don't try to read too much into that. Just treat them like they're variables and cancel out as appropriate. So, yeah, I was like trying getting caught up on canceling out for seconds. Oh, you know, from the per one second. Yeah, that yeah, was. I didn't know like, what exactly. That was unintentional. I did not mean to be tripping you up that way. Um, yes, just remember, joule seconds are going, that, that second is always going to be there. 
partly to cancel out the over one second that you get from a frequency. Because if you have, if you if we look at that initial equation, H times frequency, and just put it in units, energy is joules and frequency is one over seconds. So the constant to make that work has to be joules times seconds. So that if you divide both sides by H, you're gonna get joules canceling out joules and you're gonna be left in one over seconds. If you multiply these together, seconds cancels out seconds and you're left in joules. It's just sort of an artifact of, of how the equation works that it has these weird units that don't make intuitive sense to us. Yeah, and the frequency is normally in like hertz or something, not something per second. Right, so, so a hertz good. is per second. Yeah, but it's just like right? yes, yeah, yeah. It takes getting used to. Absolutely. All right. Any other quiz questions about the quiz? All right. Let me go back for a second. Oh, we're looking at. Okay. Uh, so electron configurations in the transition metals in general. Um, Things get kind of weird when we start looking at transition metals. Um, if you start looking at these molecular orbital or these atomic orbital diagrams with energy here, we're supposed to follow the Hofbau principle, build from the bottom up, start lowest energy, get closer. This isn't to scale, but even, even so, you can start to see how as you get further and further up, these orbitals get closer and closer in energy. The fact that they get closer and closer in energy means that any little deviations um, can cause, for instance, the 3D to hop above the 4P or the 4S to hop above the 3D in terms of energy. And so when we deal with these partially filled big orbitals, and by big, I mean anything bigger than um, than a p orbital so the d orbitals and the f orbitals when they're partially filled weird things happen remember how i, I mentioned the exchange energy and how it causes magnetism and how we always fill these um we always fill these orbitals in but that's really sloppy um but the arrows pointing the same way well be that's because if you have a bunch of unpaired electrons with the same spin, you get that, I call it a stability bonus. In fact, you get an even more of a stability bonus if you manage to fill an orbital exactly halfway. Orbitals are the most stable, either when they're completely empty or completely filled. But there is sort of a slightly stable version that corresponds with having these orbitals exactly halfway filled. And the fact that all of these different energy levels are so close together, especially when you get up into three, four, five energy levels, that that little bit of extra bonus energy can actually make it so that for a second, that 5D orbital is actually lower in energy than the 6S, right? And so they, the order, just following along with the periodic table and counting, it works really well for S orbitals and P orbitals. And it works really well for D orbitals as long as you're filling them completely. If you're not filling them completely though, that kind of falls apart because of these irregularities. So for this class, I want you to understand why those irregularities happen, but I'm not gonna make you memorize them. So the way it might show up on a test might be something like, if I ask you to do an electron configuration, it won't have any partially filled D or F orbitals. And if they're D or F orbitals, they'll either be all the way empty or all the way full. But I might say the electron configuration for chromium is argon We'll go back to the digital. The electron configuration for chromium is argon uh, 4s1 3d5. Why doesn't it follow our normal rule? I might ask you to explain the exception, not remember that it is an exception. 
you see the difference? Um, so what I would be looking for is something like, well, having the DR rule exactly halfway filled is more stable than having 4S2, 3D4. So here we have a full S orbital, which is stable, but a D orbital that's one electron away from being exactly halfway filled. And this is more stable. Having it exactly halfway filled is more stable than having a full S and four electrons in the D. We say, see the same thing with full D orbitals too. Um, the most common places to see the irregularities in the periodic table. are right near the middle of all of these big orbitals and right at the end, or rather one, one column away from the middle and one column away from exactly halfway filled or where we tend to see these irregularities because all of these ones that I circled here, if you take one electron out of the S orbital and put it in the D orbital, you get it halfway filled. But the problem is it's even that is not consistent for all four of these because those energy levels get so close together that you wind up with a lot little tiny things changing them and it doesn't behave quite the way we would expect. And this is really physicists big problem with chemistry is that they, they say well chemistry is just physics with a bunch of exceptions. Um, yeah, but the exceptions are what make it so we can actually apply it in the real world. So, again, I'm not going to make you memorize the exceptions specifically, but I'm, I will probably ask you to explain them on the midterm or the final. And speaking of midterm, it's a week from Thursday. So this Thursday we have, I think, right? This is week six. I think, no, next week is week six. So we saw it's two weeks from Thursday is the, is the midterm. Or is the Monday? Right. At this point, to avoid confusing everybody, we should just look this up. Um, so we're all on the same page. November 1st. Awesome. So you get to celebrate Halloween and then come in and take a midterm the next day. <laughs> Everybody's going to be celebrating Dia de Muertos instead. All right. Yeah. So exam one is it is Tuesday of week seven. So two weeks from today. All right. And I'll have next week your ICA will be practice midterm, which will be, it will be just if you had had the for class before, it'll be the exact format of the test as with practice problems, so you know exactly what the format's going to look like. Um, we all have a week to work on it, ask questions. Um, we will have some exam review in class as much as we have time for. Um, and then also that uh, that last ICA before the exam. All right. All right. So more team details on that as we get closer, but just so it's on everybody's radar. All right, let's let's do this problem. If we have a molecular orbital diagram or atomic orbital diagram, sorry, um, for zinc, how many electrons does zinc have when it's neutral? Thirty, right? Number thirty. So a neutral means same number of electrons. What does this look like? If we fill in 30 electrons. Well, if you have your periodic table, you can count one on your periodic table, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, oops, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, twelve 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, more electrons, right? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10. So our electron configuration for this would look something like argon gets us all the way to here, right? Argon is 18 electrons filling up the 3P. And then 4S2, 3D10. How many valence electrons does zinc have? Well, it's 12 since, since the last noble gas. What's the definition of valence electrons? Outermost shell. What about the 3S? What about the 3S? Right. So it's this is where we're going to get very specific with our definition of valence. It's the highest occupied energy level, not the highest energy orbital, highest occupied energy level principal quantum number. So not the last orbital that you filled. The, it has, a, we have electrons in N equals four, right? Only two of them. Zinc only has two valence electrons. And in fact, other than those exceptions, everything in transition metals has two valence electrons because the valence electrons are the ones that we put into that S orbital before we started filling up the D orbital. That D orbital is not part of the valence shell because N equals four is our valence shell. So now that we filled this up, um, what about zinc with a two plus charge, zinc ion, what is that going to do to our electron configuration? It will drop the force. Yeah, it's we're ne never going to break up a full B orbital. You once you fill in the orbital, it's stable. Most orbitals, the only orbitals that we will break up in order to um, make an ion are going to be the smallest orbitals. The bigger an orbital is, the harder it is to break up once it's filled. So we're not going to break this up and be left with 3D8. We're going to lose those electrons. So our electron configuration for zinc ion is going to be argon 3D10. Which brings me to another question that, that um, I get asked a lot, got asked a lot on the quiz. Um, what do I do about the order of those? Some textbooks say that you should keep all of the number threes together and then go to the number fours, but we fill up number four first before we go to 3D. What do we do with all that? The answer is for this class, I don't care. I'm okay with you writing in either way. What the way that makes the most sense to me is to write them in the order that you fill them up. But other textbooks disagree. Sometimes you see it written where it would be 3P6, 3D10, then 4S2. That's fine too. Um, I'm not going to mark you down on that either way. It's just a matter of what you want to be paying attention to is that number in the front, though. Make sure that you get that right. So, anybody ask for balance? Electrons, are you asking for the valence electrons in the last principal quantum number? Correct. That's the definition of valence. Valence means it has an older psych, psych, uh, meaning in psychology, meaning capacity for change, but it's turned into the, where you see the word valence used now specifically means the highest occupied energy level. In, in an atom or a molecule. And so the valence is always going to be whatever you have 
that has the highest number. Yeah. Look at a shell, not orbital. Shell is not orbital. It's not the last shell you build up, or sorry, not the last orbital you build up. The highest shell number. Can you go? That was going to be my next question for everybody. How many valence electrons does the zinc ion have? Eighteen. All of those are in the third energy level, right? N equals three is your highest energy level that has electrons in it. So all of them are considered valence electrons. Right. And so that's why one of the places where having it written out without this might actually be more helpful. Because then you can see, you know, if we set, if we had zinc two plus. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10. It's really obvious to look at that and say, oh, everything with the three in front of it is my valence. And if you had the 4s2 still written on there, it's really obvious to say, okay, whatever the biggest number is, that's my valence shell. And you just count how many electrons are in that n equals four or n equals three level. Depending. How would you do a Lewis dot diagram? You wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> so after this assignment, I'm not going to have you do Lewis dot structures for metal ions anymore because it's not really all that useful. It's more useful to just think of them as an object with a charge. Lewis dot structures get really helpful when we talk about covalent compounds because they start allowing us to figure out what's taking up space and what's the shape of this molecule. None of that applies to ions. So for the most part, we're going to ignore ions when it comes to Lewis dot structures. Um, and all, another point about this that I'm going to make, one of the, even this one, I can't make it a true absolute statement. There is only one case that you will ever have where you can say that um, your number of valence electrons is zero. How could we possibly have one case where your number of valence electrons is zero? When you do, I, I guess it might be more accurate to say you don't have a valence shell because there are no electrons. Like hydrogen, hydrogen with, the, with a plus charge, and um, occasionally you see helium with a plus two charge, is what's called an alpha particle. Those two. Don't have any electrons, so they don't have any occupied orbital. So if you're counting valence electrons, you could say that they have zero valence electrons, but it'd be more accurate to say they don't have a valence shell, perhaps. And, but other than that, you will never say zero for number of valence electrons. If you empty an energy level, you go to the next level below that, and that's now your valence. Oops, wrong. wrong command. All right. So hopefully after this week's ICA, this these make a lot of sense now, right? It's always the same process. They always go in the same order unless you happen to have one of those weird exceptions with a partially filled or network. All right. And just as a lead in to your assignment. The week you have one assignment the week of your midterm that you basically do it after you take the midterm before you have any anything new you can start working on it. Um, it's alternative ways of viewing the periodic table. There are a lot of ways you can arrange the periodic table that don't look like the regular structure we're used to seeing. And it has you pick a couple of them, analyze them, explain what you like and don't like about them, including one that doesn't have the wrong answer. It's just which one is aesthetically pleasing to you, um, which is kind of a fun one because you can find like hexagonal spiral shaped periodic tables um, or periodic tables that look like this where they're arranged by orbital energies with, so it's basically the same shape as these diagrams, right? Except instead of just putting arrows for electrons, I put the, the elements that correspond to those orbitals in there. And, and have it arranged according to energy level. So 
this is just to, to show the connection between these structures and the periodic table that we're used to looking at. Right? And maybe make the point that this is why we fill up the 4S is slightly lower in energy than the 3D. And because it's slightly lower in energy, we fill this one up first. All right. One last thing of uh, review before we get going. You guys covered ion, uh, through ionic radius with Carl, right? All right, so we'll review this just slightly when we come back from break. We'll come back at 10 after and do some practice, and then we'll get into ionization energy and the rest of the periodic trends. There's no, yeah, when you look at certain it doesn't apply for the same. I was going to say, for especially for that, you can track that very, very clearly. You have to look at all cases of people who skip drop visit and they don't want to put in work, so to speak. And they call it might be my genetics or just yeah. random chance. People don't like to train their genes. That's something that bothers them. And so if they can look at something else and say, oh, well, I can see how this makes it or this was the cause that made that happen. That's comforting. Yeah. And so a lot of pseudoscience is that they just make people they feel like they're doing something, even if it doesn't do anything, they make them feel better. Like I'm getting so much Basically, what you did on the three lap is you calculated this energy. You calculated the energy of n equals two and one and looked at the difference between them. And then what this is having you do is do the Balmer series is everything that ends at n equals two. All right, yeah, all right, cool. That makes sense. So if we match this up, we have a number from up here, yeah. right? Or you know, um, yeah, this equation is cool. it should be something more like in the hundreds to get the nanometers. Yeah. Um, but so if you have this number and it matches one of these these numbers that we get to so you uh, match them up and then say, okay, that corresponds to transition uh, from n equals three to n equals two. So okay. you just write three uh, arrow and two. Uh, okay. uh, uh, well, uh, 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 yes, so like ostriches. Yeah, so once you get them down, it's burning. Yeah, I'm going to do this. 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 I'm going
same table or the same row here. Somebody said decreases. Does anybody remember why? Exactly. So we, the more protons you have, the more they're pulling on the electron, pulling it in tighter. So for the same number of electrons, you're going to make things more dense. And when you're adding electrons within the same energy level, they're not going to take up extra room because you already have that energy level kind of has a fixed radius, regardless of how many electrons it has. In it. So think about people, people staying in a, we use a VRBO or a, a, a vacation rental. If you have, it doesn't really matter when it comes to the footprint of the house. It doesn't matter if you've got 10 people staying there or two people staying there, right? The footprint of the house is the same. But once you get above a certain threshold, you've got to rent another house, right? And now all of a sudden your footprint increased. So renting another house is like adding another energy level. But then as you're filling out, filling up that new house, you're not increasing your footprints, you're making everything more compact when you do that. So when you go from left to right in the same row, things get smaller. And then every time you, you hit the end of a row and add another energy level, it ratchets back up and then starts climbing down again. So with that in mind, We have carbon and fluorine, which is going to be smaller. Well, one of them is right. Carbon or fluorine, they're the same number of energy levels, but fluorine has more protons. Therefore, it's more dense and smaller. So carbon is greater than fluorine. You know, just be careful with the language and make sure that you're answering the question I asked, because I think it actually said, which is larger, and then I turned around and I asked you which one is smaller. So that's easy to do on the test too, right? Make sure you're answering the question that's actually what I asked. And one way you can do that is by using greater than, less than, because whichever way you write it, I'm going to interpret this as carbon is bigger than fluorine, right? So this answers the question regardless of which way it was written originally. Um, and frankly, I think on the test, I'm going to have, it won't just be 50-50, it'll be arrange these from smallest to largest in groups of three. So it's a little bit more thought than just a 50-50 chance. Um, but that's, that's basically one of the 
one of the ways that I can write a test question about periodic trends is have you compare, have you arrange things in order? And so the next one was chlorine and bromine. So chlorine versus bromine. Which one's which one's bigger? Bromine. Same column on the periodic table, more rows or more energy levels. So bromine is greater than chlorine. Um, and just since we have the quiz coming up on Thursday for atomic symbols, I'll make the reminder when you're writing out your atomic symbols, you have to make it explicit whether a letter is uppercase or lowercase. Um, I don't want to see anybody write the period or the uh, symbol for sodium as that. Like, yes, from context, we can look at that and say, okay, that's probably sodium. But if you get a little bit sloppy with your handwriting, it's really easy to miss whether that's a capital or not, right? So things like that, don't write it like that. Make it explicit whether it's an uppercase or a lowercase. Either that or you can put the tail on it. So writing it this way, just don't make it too long with the tail. Because then it looks like a capital L. So the, the way that I was taught first was to turn every lowercase L as a um, cursive L because then it's explicit. Um, I'm not going to say I'm forcing you to write it like this. If you write it like this and you're careful with your handwriting, I'm okay with this. Um, but be careful. Don't make it look like if you start getting into that realm. Right, there's, there, it's not like I can put a, a hard line in the sands on that, right? So that sort of be careful. And if you're not careful enough for my case that particular day, I might leave you a quarter of a point or something like that. It will never be something oppressive, but this is the way to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and really L's, and for some reason, the uppercase ends, people that do regular uppercase letters for everything else, Sometimes we'll do an uppercase N like this. Um, those are the ones that I see most commonly mixed up. Um, are there any others? Uh, those are the biggest ones. And when it comes to writing out the names, I don't care. Technically, you don't capitalize when you're writing out the, the names. You don't capitalize the T in titanium unless it's at the beginning of a sentence. Um, and same for all, all molecule names. Um, but I'm not going to grade you down on that or anything like that. And I'm not going to grade on spelling unless it's atrocious and real and usually where i draw the line is if somebody a chemist looked at this name would they be able to figure out what element you were talking about so if it's you switch the o and the u in chlorine that's fine that happens people spell it as flowering all the time um but if it's leaving out an entire syllable like ytterbium versus yttrium you could really, ytterbium is, the, the reason they're named so confusingly is because they were both discovered in the same small Swedish village called Ytterb. Um, so ytterbium and yttrium, if you leave out that second syllable in ytterbium, it's very, really, really close to yttrium, right? So usually if you leave out a whole syllable or you get the wrong ending, um, you know, if instead of bromine, you wrote chromium, mm, that's not really the same anymore, right? So it, it's not something that I can put a hard line on, but I'm not going to be too strict on the spelling. It's going to depend on what the element is. If you drop an S in sulfur, that matters a lot yeah, more than something else. Um, 
Yeah, I don't care if you can spell Tennessee properly. Does it two S's or one? I don't remember off the top. I think it's two, but I'm not sure, right? But it's going to depend on the context a little bit. Thank you. And just know that I will try to apply that as evenly as I can. But if you feel, if you look at yours, you look at your friends, and you and you got marked it down different amounts for the same spelling error, it happens sometimes when I grade a whole stack of these. Scores kind of migrate from 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 front to back sometimes. Um, so just bring that to my attention if you notice anything like that. It's not intentional. Um, it's I'm trying to be as even as I can. And the easiest ones to create are the ones that are perfect. So just get it all right and you won't have to worry about that. <laughs> all right. How about calcium two plus and sulfide two minus? So let's look at how many electrons they have first. So sulfide is going to have 18 electrons. Calcium with the two plus is going to have 18 electrons. So same number of electrons. So same number of orbitals occupied, right? Same electron configuration. The only difference is what? Number of protons. And more protons means bigger or smaller? Bigger. Smaller. It means heavier, but pulled in tighter. So calcium 2 plus is going to be smaller. So say sulfide is greater than calcium 2 plus. And again, if you wrote it the other way, that would be just as fine. This answers both ways. That's me. This tells us what's the smallest and what's the biggest by writing it like this. So because they both have 18 electrons, so they both have the same electron configuration, the same number of, of energy levels. Calcium having more positive charges in the middle means that those electrons are attracted that much more, that they're pulled in that much tighter, which makes it smaller. Exactly, and sulfide only has 16. So even though they have the same number of electrons, the number of protons tightens everything up. Thank you. All right. And the other one was oxide versus neon. This is getting into so oxide with the two minus. We're starting to get into the realm of things that are close enough that it's going to be kind of hard to make a judgment call because the noble gases behave a little bit funny when you um but following our general trends we would expect neon to be smaller right and oxide would be bigger because neon has more uh protons for the same number of electrons and when i'm asking these questions on the test i'm not looking for the exceptions in fact, that's one of the ways that I can tell when people are cheating um, is if I ask you a question like this that doesn't follow the general trend, I want you to answer it with the general trends. But if you go on your phone and you look up the real atomic radii and you say it's the other way around, I know that you looked it up because I want you to answer it based on the general trends, not the actual numbers. Right? I'm not trying to ask about the exceptions with these. And if I do, that's totally by accident. But nobody in this class is going to cheat, so it's not going to be an issue. I don't have to worry about that. We would expect neon to be smaller than the oxide ion. When you get to, yeah, it, it's one of those that's going to be real close, though because they're so close in the number of protons and they have the same number of electrons. So that would probably not be one that I would try to ask on the, on the test. All right, so we understand electron configuration, where we're getting there, and atomic radius kind of makes sense following that. <clears throat> So this next 
concept is very, very closely related to electron configuration, right? So this is still considered a periodic trend. And when we say periodic trend, we just mean it's something where you can make some generalizations just by looking at the periodic table. Um, ionization energy is defined as the energy required to move, remove an electron. So it's more specific than what it sounds like. Ionization energy sounds like the energy to make it an ion, but it's not just making any ion. It's specifically the energy to remove an electron. It says nothing about it says nothing about giving an electron, right? And if we plot ionization energy versus atomic number. We can see that there's some general trends as we go from left to right across the periodic table. We can see that the ionization energy goes up. Generally from left to right, your ionization energy increases. The, cool, the further you get to the right, the harder it is to remove an electron. The more closely those atoms hold the electrons towards themselves, which makes sense. Same logic as with the atomic radius, right? More protons means it's harder to remove an electron. And even more than that, the other aspect of this is the closer you get to having a full orbital, the harder it is to remove an electron. Mostly. So again, I really dislike making absolute statements. I do a lot of, of um, my friend from grad school always referred to it as the aliens caveat. They mostly come in back, mostly. It mostly goes up from left to right, mostly. But mostly that you have to worry about, right? The exceptions. Am I the only one who associates that word with that movie that strongly? I can't hear the word mostly without thinking about the little girl from Aliens. It's a really good movie if you haven't seen it before. Watch Alien by Ridley Scott first and then followed up by James Cameron's Aliens. Fantastic horror action movies from the 80s. Um, what's going on with beryllium versus boron and nitrogen versus oxygen? It's changing blocks, which means it's doing what? What does the electron configuration look like for beryllium? Well, beryllium is number four, right? So beryllium is 1s2, 2s2, and boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So what's happening that makes it so that despite the fact boron has more protons, it's easier to take an electron away. We've only got one electron in a p orbital, right? If we take that away, we're, we're left with only full orbitals now. Versus here, we have we already have only full orbitals. If we take an electron away, we're gonna have to break up the full orbital to do it. It's only an s orbital, it's not that hard to break up an s orbital compared to P's and D's and so on, but it's still, it's still rather not. Once you fill an orbital, it wants to stay filled. I'm using it morphic language, but you know what I mean? It's more stable to keep it filled than to break it up. So we should see that if that's the case, then we should see that disconnect all on every row of the periodic table. And we do for the first three rows anyway. Sodium is easy to take an electron away from, then it's hard to take an electron away from magnesium. And then it's easier to take the electron away from, what is that? Uh, not silicon, what's one next to silicon? Aluminum, thank you. All right, and the reason we don't see that same thing happening here is because the d orbital makes things complicated. Because those energy levels are now so close together, 
and we have so many exceptions in the D block, we don't see as obvious of a jump when we fill an S orbital once we get down here. We see big jumps when we get over here to a full D orbital, but it's a little bit different. It's the same principle though. What's going on there? Halfway through the D block. Halfway through the D block, right? Remember that I said all those exceptions in the D block show up right when you're close to being able to get an electron and orbital exactly halfway filled. Exactly halfway filled is not as good as all the way filled, but it's better than nothing. And so we see a similar disconnect for nitrogen and oxygen because for nitrogen, that was oxygen. Nitrogen is electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p what? Nitrogen's three. Oxygen's 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So even though oxygen has more protons, we would think that that means it's pulling them in tighter. The fact that if it loses one electron, it can be exactly halfway filled in that B orbital means it's a little bit easier to take that away than it is to break up in a P orbital that's exactly halfway filled. And again, we still continue to see that to some extent, although it gets less pronounced as we go on. Um, because again, P orbitals and F orbitals make things weird. It's really, really obvious, though, for these first couple rows. And it's really easy to explain in terms of electron configurations in those orbital diagrams. All right, so this is just explaining it graphically. So boron versus beryllium. Which one would have a higher ionization energy? Beryllium, we have a higher ionization energy. Higher, we have to be careful with the language here. Higher ionization energy means harder to take an electron away. So beryllium would be harder to take an electron away from than boron. And nitrogen and oxygen. If we look at nitrogen versus oxygen, exactly halfway filled versus has one extra electron away from being halfway filled. So a higher ionization energy, it's harder to break that one. Exactly, exactly. And, and not even just having unpaired electrons with the same spin, there's something even more magical about when you can have it exactly halfway filled when every piece of it has one up spin electron, that's even better. So it's more than additive. It's, it's, I really hate to use this word, but synergistic. If you get all of them halfway filled, that's better than almost all of them halfway filled by a long shot. And so if we look at the orbitals that have five possibilities, There's some amount of extra stability from having them all the same spin, having four of them the same spin. But you gain a huge bonus once you do that. The fact that it's all of these options have a spin up is different than just, it's not additive. It's, a, it's beyond the sum of just the sum of adding up those, all those, those pieces together. Right, so specifically, it has to be exactly halfway filled to get that, that extra bonus. You get a tiny bonus for having four of them on pair fit with the same spin, and you get a big bonus for having five of them with the same spin. It's 
side note, besides looking at the periodic table, has anybody figured out how you, how you can tell how many uh, electrons can fit in each type of orbital? How many, how many electrons can fit into an S orbital? Which counts for one box, right? And how many electrons can fit into a P orbital? In a D orbital? So an F orbital? 14. We're going up by two times odd integers. What about a G orbital? There's seven boxes here. So it shall be nine boxes. So 18. The Basically, that comes out of our definition of those quantum numbers that we talked about. Remember that the number of different options for how many boxes you could have was tied to, so you had N was your principal quantum number, and L was everything from zero up to N minus one. And M, and that one went from negative L to zero to positive L. So every time you add a new type of orbital, that new type of orbital is going to go up by it's going to be two times N plus one. Basically, add, we're basically adding two new boxes every time we go up an energy level. Which means writing four new electrons every time we go up an energy level. Not that I'm going to test you on this specifically, but that's again why the periodic table has the shape it does, why it goes two in the S block, six in the P block, 10 in the D block, 14 in the F block. If we had a G block, it would have 18 elements across. And there are G, G orbitals exist. But they're so high in energy that we have, and you have to get up to n equals five to even see a g orbital. We've never observed a g orbital directly. But we know mathematically they exist. We just can't make elements big enough to have a g orbital in an observable way. Yet. And in theory, they go up past that. There's an h orbital after a g orbital, and so on. An h orbital would hold 22 electrons. The 11 boxes across. Right, the flip side to ionization energy is almost literally the exact opposite. Um, but the language changes it a little bit too. Ionization energy is how hard is it to remove an electron? Electron affinity, affinity means that you like something, right? Or that you're good at it or you're attracted to something for some reason. That's what affinity means. Electron affinity is how much each of the elements gains stability when you add an extra electron. Electrons are pretty much always going to be attracted to a nucleus, even if it's a negatively charged nucleus or a neutral nucleus, those electrons are going to stick to it because that's more stable being close to a nucleus than to have an electron out by itself somewhere which is why those vacuum tubes and the old CRT monitors, if you cracked them, the screen didn't work anymore. It wasn't like our laptop screens, your phone screens now where you can crack them and they still work. It's just, you know, don't cut yourself. Um, the old CRT vacuum tubes, if there was air in there, the electrons could not fly the way they were supposed to and the, the whole thing stopped working. Um, because an electron will almost always stick the sun to any element that happens to be around. How stable it is, is what we call electron affinity, right? So something with a really negative electron affinity means it becomes a lot more stable when you give it an extra electron. Something with a positive electron affinity 
means it's not stable when you give it an extra, um, an extra electron. And basically, it's just the um, the noble gases, and then there's a few elements that are right at the end of a row of the or a column of the uh, orbital blocks that it's actually harder to give beryllium an electron than to just have the electron around. If you tried to make beryllium have a negative charge, you gave beryllium and somehow forced it to take an extra electron, as soon as you let go of it, that electron would fly off on its own without even having something there to take it. Um, because it actually becomes less stable when you add an electron to beryllium. But basically, it's the same exact logic as ionization energy, except in reverse. Things that are really, really hard to take an electron from tend to be easy to give an electron to, the exception being noble gases. Why don't the noble gases want to gain or lose an electron? They already have only four orbitals, right? So to gain an electron or give up an electron makes them less stable. For the most part though, we're gonna, we mostly ignore the noble gases because they're boring. They don't do anything. So when I picture the periodic table in my head, generally speaking, fluorine is the top right corner. Because I ignore helium and neon, they're boring. They don't do anything. Um, as you go up into the right, your electron affinity goes up. You become more and more stable. Your electron affinity, and the, the negative sign makes it weird a little bit. You have to think about what we're trying to say. Things get more stable, so their energy goes down. Right, so a negative electron affinity means it really wants that electron. Right, it's just one of those places where the language makes the negative signs weird. A little bit like it did with our our, our um, lab from last weekend, or last week, where we said, oh, the energy that's given up by the electron is the same as the energy of the photon that left, right? All that happened is we switched the negative sign on it, and it was just handled by descriptive language, basically, by switching our frame of reference. It's similar with this. So, I'm not going to be specific about positives and negatives. I'm going to say, if I say what has a higher electron affinity, that means more negative. If I said something with a low electron affinity would have a positive electron affinity. Because a positive number is the least negative number you could have. All right, so summary slide. When we're looking at the periodic table, the three biggest trends that we look at are atomic radius, which includes ionic radius, right? It's the same logic for ionic radius. You just have to think about number of electrons. What did you do when you made it to ions? Ionization energy and electron affinity. And for both of those, we're only talking about the first time you add or remove an electron. So if we got really specific, there's first ionization energy and then there's second ionization energy, which would be the energy to remove a second electron. We're not going to get into that for now. It follows all the same rules though. Um, and it just has to do with filling electrons or filling orbitals or making them exactly half filled are things that are more stable. Barely filled orbitals are less stable, or orbitals that are one electron away from being half filled are less stable. It all comes back to the electron configuration. Now. One more, one more thing that I'm not going to test you on, but something you should see because it might show up on um, on a standardized test is metallic character. It's really hard to actually put a a number to it. Um, and it gets a little bit hazy, but the, why it's worth bringing up is that these characteristics are not what we think of as being metals. The most metallic elements are not the most, the things we see as metal all the time. 
the things that we see as metal all the time, we see them as metal because they're either stable enough to exist in air without oxidizing um, or because they're really, really common and cheap. The metals have low ionization energy, which leads to high ductility, which is, can you stretch it into a wire? If you grab both ends and stretch it, does it stretch like a piece of chewing gum or saltwater taffy or pick your confection of choice? Starburst. <laughs> um, or malleable means you can hammer it flat. Like we talked about gold, gold is pretty malleable. And they also tend to have both high thermal conductivity and high electrical conductivity. But chemically, we look at its lowest ionization energy, means most metallic character will lead to these others. So where would we expect to find the most metallic elements? On my ground? I mean, on the periodic table. Low ionization energy. Yeah, down over here. The problem is that they're so reactive that we can't actually make a wire out of cesium. If we did, it would have really, really good conductivity, but it would burst from the flames if it got exposed to oxygen. So, you know, we try not to do that. You don't usually want your electric, your electronics to burst through the flames. Um, so these that what we call the coin metals. They're, we call them coin metals and they're really well known and have been for thousands of years because they're stable in the presence of oxygen. And they do a decent job of being conductive. They're, they're better at being conductive and have lower ionization energy than say aluminum. And we don't use aluminum for wiring anymore because it's really, it is really easy to oxidize. Um, but it doesn't have those other properties. You can't take it and stretch it out well. You can't hammer it flat very well. Um, and there's some other things that go along with aluminum as well. But, all right, I'm not going to test you on that, though. I just wanted to mention it so that you're aware that that concept exists. And we'll end a couple minutes early. And we'll pick up on Thursday. Don't forget the quiz. <laughs>